Well, good morning. Um, my name is Chad Swarthout. Uh, my company is uh, Electrona. We're a, a Jamf integrator, um, an Apple consultant. Um, been supporting Apple devices in a variety of business, education, government environments for you know, probably about eight years at this point. Um, here to talk about automating your zero touch deployment with Jamf Pro. Um, I'm going to try to keep this not too slide intensive and kind of more just a conversation about some of the things that we've encountered working with uh, organizations that have been struggling with, you know, how to get from, you know, we get, we purchased Jamf Pro, we've got our jump start, we learned a little bit about what we need to do, um, and then we heard we've got this great picture we see, you know, we're, we've got this MacBook and it's got a sticky note on it that says all you need to do is turn it on and everything will be done. Um, and we know that the reality is there's a little bit of work we have to do getting from A to B. Um, so a big part of this is trying to figure out how we can save ourselves some time. Um, like this quote, I'm lazy, but it's the lazy people who invented the wheel and the bicycle because they don't like walking or carrying things. Um, I feel like this is kind of something we should take to heart. Um, if we're trying to figure out a way to provide that seamless user experience for our end users, um, you know, we should put ourselves in a place where you know, our lives are not constantly running on a hamster wheel you know, all day long. Um, and I can tell you there are a lot of things that I don't like doing, um, so I try to figure out a way to not have to do those things. Um, again, just a little bit about me. Um, I've been uh, working supporting Apple devices since 2006, started doing hardware repairs, probably some folks in the room maybe you know, have some background in that area, lots of screws and glue and all sorts of fun things that I'm glad I don't have to do anymore, one of those things, uh, glad to be in the past. Um, sort of smart started doing uh, home and small business uh, consulting, um, worked as a Jamf integrator, so we do a lot of jump starts, um, help Jamf customers get set up for success. Um, I'm sort of the lead administrator in my organization. We've got um, a team of five or so at the moment and probably going to be growing from there. Um, and, you know, in addition to kind of all those things, I've got, you know, a team that I need to support and train and empower and try to make their lives as easy as possible as well. Um, and, you know, it's hard. <laughs> um, this isn't, you know, this isn't easy. Um, just kind of show of hands in the room, I guess, you know, at least a year of experience working with Jamf Pro in your organization? Two years? Three years? Four years? All right, well, I'm just going to stop there, but some of you guys probably know more than I do about some things. <laughs> um, but I guess, you know, just taking a look, you know, what is it that, that makes this so difficult, right? <coughs> we've got amazing tools, we've got a great community, we've got you know, conferences like this here at, at PSU, we've got, you know, got Mac Admin Slack, you know, we had, you know, uh, listservs and, you know, IRC before that, we've got Jamf Nation, you know, pretty much, you know, at the end of the day, everything's been provided for us. If we want to be successful, chances are somebody's already done what it is that we want to accomplish. Um, and, you know, when it comes down to it, it really just is, well, you know, I want to accomplish all these different things, but I don't have a whole lot of time to get them done. Um, so we've got the tools, right? We come in, we get set up, we've got, you know, we get set up with Jamf Pro, we spend a few months trying to figure that out. Maybe we go to a certification class. Um, I teach our uh, Jamf 200 courses in, uh, in Washington, D.C., where we're based out of. Um, see a lot of folks come through there and, you know, trying to figure out, well, you know, how do I take that information that I learned initially, how do I build upon it? Um, you know, we're kind of a lot of folks in here probably, you know, build a package or two every week, maybe more than that. Oh, I'm glad to see not too many, but that's, you know, maybe, maybe a few. Um, you know, and we got to test those things. We got to, you know, kind of do that over and over again, right? Um, so, you know, what can we do to kind of get out of that cycle of doing the same thing every week? Because um, I imagine that there may be some things we want to try to do that we're not doing right now, you know. Um, security assessments, um, you know, maybe better training for end, your end users, maybe take a vacation from time to time. <laughs> um, you know, we're looking at, you know, kind of the landscape is constantly changing. Uh, you know, we're looking at, you know, 
kind of the last couple of years, uh, half the sessions here seem to be based on, you know, telling people that, you know, imaging is dead and, you know, maybe you should check and make sure that imaging is dead, but it's, it's actually not a thing anymore. Um, it can be, but you really shouldn't do it, but maybe you still want to because that's what you've been doing, but really you shouldn't do it anymore. <laughs> um, so, you know, we're, we're trying to figure out, you know, how do we deal with this? How do we make things go more quickly um, when we have to deal with things like running an installer, when we have to, you know, build a, you know, set up a new computer, when we've got to, you know, repurpose an existing computer for another user. Um, we've got application updates and, you know, we, we've certainly seen where product development at Jamf has been focused a lot on, you know, what has been referred to over the past few years as patch, right? You know, we're kind of all waiting for the day that we don't have to patch things anymore. We're just going to click that one big button and everything's going to be fixed. Um, but I'll talk a little bit about that in a bit, but I, I don't think that it's ever going to get quite that easy. Um, so, you know, we've got a lot of the things that we do over and over again. Um, we need to make sure that we're careful not to make a bigger chore out of that automation. Because um, sometimes, you know, we end up trying to build a new system to replace an existing system, and then we're spending all of our time tweaking that new system um, to where we're, you know, we end up not implementing, spending way more time than we were before. Um, you know, I'm sure some of this resonates with some folks in the room. Um, so what I want to talk about today, primarily, is about what has worked for us, what we've seen in some customer environments, and I want to spend a good amount of time just kind of doing more of a conversation, talking to some folks in the room about, you know, what you guys have been struggling with, you know, also, you know, maybe some folks can talk a little bit about, you know, where, where they've found success. Um, because at the end of the day, there's, there's no silver bullet, but there are some things that you can do to make things easier. And we've, we've come across, you know, a good number of organizations that we've worked with, um, whether they be in corporate environments, whether they be in education, um, whether they're in, in government or, you know, some other, uh, place somewhere in between. Um, and the struggles are really a lot of the same things. Um, folks say, you know what, I've got applications that I want to get installed, but I don't have somebody who can full-time be dedicated to, you know, building packages or setting up, you know, new builds. Um, you know, I feel like every time we build an image, we have to redo it and we've got something new we have to do. Or maybe not, a, not an image, but, you know, we're setting up a bunch of policies and we want to make sure that that stuff stays current because we set it up and we come back, you know, a month later and it doesn't work anymore or the software is out of date, our users getting prompted to, you know, to install updates. How do we deal with that? Um, and, you know, sometimes it's just, you know, we've got, you know, adjustments in our environment that are happening all the time, but I've got, you know, a pile of, you know, other paperwork I've got to do. I've got other areas that I support. Kind of who in the room is not just a Mac admin in their organization? Maybe they do some other things. <laughs> maybe you're a network engineer as well. Maybe you're, you know, maybe you support Windows as well. Maybe you support mobile devices. Um, you know, I, I know in our organization, you know, it's not, uh, not just one thing. We support a lot of small business customers with managed services where, you know, we're the entire IT department. Um, and a lot of smaller orgs, that's often one person, two people, you know, if you're lucky. Um, you know, I've talked to some organizations where they're like, yeah, we had two people, budget wasn't there, we're down to one and a half, or maybe it's just me now. Um, and you've got to figure out how to balance your time. Um, and I know that there, you know, there was a workshop yesterday on uh, time management. Um, anybody managed to take a look at that? Pop into that one. Um, so, you know, some of it is just trying to figure out how to structure your day, and some of it is trying to figure out how do we deal with all of the things that are coming at me at once. Um, and, you know, I'm just trying to help figure out, well, how can we make this one little piece a little bit easier? So, a couple lessons that we've learned. Um, you know, and some of these things may be fairly basic, uh, but, you know, using the App Store, um, you know, use VPP, leverage device-based application assignments. Um, we've got, you know, a number of organizations we've run into that, you know, are, are still packaging App Store updates, you know, every time they get updated. Um, we've got, you know, some folks that are using, you know, the non-App Store version of applications. Um, and really in truth, uh, this is probably the easiest way to do deployment of, of applications and application updates imaginable um, because it is built in. 
Um, this is something that you can take advantage of, if, you know, through MDM. Um, and largely, you know, these types of things are going to be about as vetted as you can be. I know, you know, there are probably going to be some shrieks and horrors when I talk about some of my uh, thoughts around software updates for some common applications, but. Um, you know, there is a lot to be gained from taking advantage of automatic updates um, and automatic app deployments. And, you know, we'll talk a little bit about some challenges around leveraging VPP, um, you know, when you have kind of a mix of App Store versus non-App Store apps in your environment. Um, talking about, you know, trying to script what we can, script and automate what it is that, uh, you know, is challenging for us. So. You know, whether you're a Python guru or whether maybe you know a little bit of bash scripting or maybe you don't know a whole lot at all, but you, you know, at least know how to read through a script and make sure it's not going to break everything and you can test it, um, you know, taking advantage of that. Um, there are a good number of folks in the community, um, not to mention, you know, kind of folks who have done something similar that we can take advantage of and leverage that. Um, a lot of applications are available at a specific URL from a vendor, um, and you can get the latest version just by always going to that same URL. Um, you know, if we're talking about Google Chrome, you know, we know exactly where to get that every time we want to download it, right? If we're going to build a package, we know where we're finding it. You know, maybe we can have our endpoint devices actually take advantage of that if that's an application that we're not so concerned about, you know, installing the latest version at all times. Um, you know, and there are some other things that we can do as well, you know, when we're talking about, you know, adjusting settings or, you know, things that we maybe are doing manually, trying to figure out, well, if I'm doing this more than a few times per week and this is taking up a good amount of my time and maybe if it's, it's taking up someone's time who isn't me, but it's, you know, one of my help desk folks who's, you know, out in the field and helping people get set up with their, their new Mac or maybe I've got a lot of tickets and I'm seeing the same issue popping up over and over again, um, you know, that added productivity for your team can multiply um, if we can, you know, identify where those areas are that we're kind of engaging in a repetitive task. Um, I know that there are some folks who, you know, insist on everything being package deployment, and I would say if you are an organization that has adequate resources and a large enough team to where you can spend the appropriate and, you know, recommended time, uh, you know, packaging, testing, um, testing again, validating and, and deploying all of your uh, you know, applications via um, packages that you build and test internally, I would say go for it. You know, that's awesome. I just know that the reality is a lot of organizations don't have the infrastructure to deal with that. There have been a few uh, attempts in the community to have kind of package repositories available. Um, you know, we'll t I'll talk a little bit about auto package. Um, but, I, you know, from my perspective, I don't have a whole lot of time. And if it's something that doesn't require a whole lot of custom work, rely on somebody else's effort to build that package. And you know, sometimes maybe it isn't a package, but it's kind of good enough. Um, leveraging, you know, using configuration profiles. Um, you know, we're talking about deploying settings um, to users' Macs. Um, what I said about scripting, I'd say, you know, kind of throw that out the window if it's something that we can do with a configuration profile. Um, I know that this is something new, especially for folks who've been supporting Macs for a long time. Um, you know, things like custom settings payloads in configuration profiles really can be a nice way to be able to set a setting. And if something doesn't work or we need to make a change, this, there is no faster or easier way to keep track of what it is that you're doing than through profiles. Um, you know, we have all this great stuff that came along with MDM and it's been around for a long time and we you know, should do what we can to take advantage of that. Um, and kind of finally here, leverage the community. I'm going to talk a lot, um, you know, in the next few slides about, you know, some folks in the community that, that I've relied a lot upon. Um, I know that, you know, if you're here, chances are you're already doing this. Um, but try to do it more um, if you're not. You know, we all sort of live in our own island when we're not here at, at a conference, when we're not, um, you know, at some sort of event where there are other folks who are struggling with the same things. Um, but the community has, you know, definitely made um, this a lot less challenging. Um, I don't know, it just kind of, again, show of hands, just more to keep people awake than anything else, but Windows admins in the room? Um, just, you know, for the folks that have been supporting Windows, would you say that there is a difference between the community here for the Mac admin side than there is on Windows? Yeah. 
So you know, I, w we support both platforms, and there are a ton more Windows admins out there than there are Mac admins. You know, it's kind of nice because there's always a demand for us. Uh, <laughs> I think it's probably easier to get a job um, as a Windows admin sometimes because there are, you know, there seems to always be a shortage of folks who you know do what we do. Um, but you know, I, I'm not sure what it is about this community, but I really like it in that, you know, if you're looking to solve a particular problem, um, there's a good place to go and find that solution 90 some percent of the time. Um, when I'm dealing with an issue and, you know, it sounds like the Windows uh, admins in the room can attest to what I'm talking about. Uh, when I'm dealing with a challenging issue and it's something on another platform, um, I don't have that community to back me up. Um, and I don't have sort of other folks saying I'm dealing with the same exact issue and here's what it is that I'm doing to solve that problem. Um, and I'm not sure what has sort of led to that, but it's a really, really great thing that we have. And I, you know, would say, you know, let's absolutely keep that going. I don't think it's going anywhere, but certainly um, if you've got something that, you know, you've got a problem that you've solved, if you've got a challenge that you've overcome, um, sharing it with the community and, you know, reaching out to others who are dealing with the same problem, you know, helps everybody feel a little less alone um, because, uh, you know, much as I said before, because there are fewer of us, we often tend to be the one or two people in our organization that do this. Um, so most of the people who are going to be your peers may not actually work next to you, but may work somewhere else, um, but you can, you know, take advantage of that collaboration. Um, so just talking a little bit about VPP, um, certainly, as I said earlier, easiest way to manage applications if the app's available in the App Store. Um, the one thing that I do run into, uh, in, and we've run into this challenge as well, um, if we have applications that are already installed um, and they are uh, you know, the non-App Store variety, or perhaps they were installed by a user with a specific Apple ID, um, maybe prior to you know, having device-based VPP assignments, uh, which, you know, is something that only came out in the last couple of years. Um, you know, maybe you've got some legacy apps in your environment that you're trying to figure out, well, you know, I've, I've scoped this, I've got this application set to assign to the device, um, but it's not installing, it's not keeping up to date. Um, what we need to do is make sure that we just remove those um, and, uh, you know, making sure that we're leveraging smart groups, um, keeping track of which devices actually have um, the eligibility to have our VPP app installed on the device, um, you know, will make things a lot easier. Um, if we've got um, applications already installed or devices that for whatever reason are not eligible to uh, install those uh, VPP apps, um, we're going to see those pending failed commands um, and have to clear those out. Um, one of the other things that uh, is important for us to keep in mind is that uh, we do have to make sure that that user level MDM uh, setting is enabled uh, on each device. One of the nice things as part of uh, enrolling devices with DEP is that that comes down automatically. Um, Jamf Pro is also, you know, turning that on by default um, now where, you know, before that was kind of a hit or miss thing, whether that actually took place. Um, is everybody in here familiar with how to deal with a whole lot of pending and failed commands? Um, if they have a bunch of devices that are all, you know, perhaps we did something wrong and it's not pushing out. Um, bottom right corner, you know, when we're doing a search, looking at a smart group, you know, we've got that action button. Um, super easy way for us to go ahead and clear those out. Um, I've also seen some folks who are, you know, leveraging the Jampro API to, you know, identify computers with those commands um, that are pending or failed and flushing those out on a per device basis. Um, <coughs> absolutely going to be something that will make your life easier uh, if we can take advantage of that. Um, but unfortunately, not everything's in the App Store. Um, we heard at WWDC this year that uh, Office likely will be in the App Store at some point. Um, but you know, we've got at least one behemoth application that we've got to install all over the place that isn't in the App Store. Um, I'd say probably a good you know, 80% of probably what we're deploying is not an App Store application unless you happen to be in a really lucky environment. Um, so, you know, we've got some things we've got to deal with here. So, um, I talked, a little, uh, talked earlier about, you know, scripting updates and, um, you know, leveraging scripting whenever we can. 
Um, so just kind of to give a little bit of background about where my uh, kind of interest in this area started, uh, bash scripting or you know Python scripting was not something that um, came naturally to me when I started out as an admin. Um, but you know a couple things were you know shown to me very early on. Um, anybody in here using Rich Troughton's Flash and Java update scripts in their environment? If not, you should be if you're actually installing Flash and Java in your environment. Um, but there are some folks in the community that have identified applications that need to be patched on a regular basis and are available from a vendor's website. Um, if you're in such an environment where you don't have to restrict your user's access to the internet and you feel confident being able to obtain applications directly from a vendor's website, um, it's fairly straightforward for us to take advantage of uh, you know, simply a, a short bash script to go ahead and download an application and get installed. Now, if we're talking about updating applications, we may want to get a little bit more careful about how we do that, making sure that that application isn't open, um, making sure that you know, that update is, in fact, something that we want to go ahead and install, and you know, trying to figure out how we go about vetting that um, is going to be important. There's this great um, site that kind of looks like malware, um, which is what I've got as my uh, second option there. Is anybody taking a look at getmacapps.com? Um, I was going to write some scripts and go through that, but I, um, I felt like this was a little bit more entertaining. Um, one of the uh, classes that I took a few years ago when I was, t I was taking a JAMP class and it was brought up to, to take a look at this website. Um, and I'm sitting here and I'm like, this is the most terrifying thing I've seen in my life. Um, if you take a look at this website, check a bunch of boxes, um, it'll then say, you know, a command gets generated, which is basically for you to just uh, sudo sh, you know, whatever comes from this uh, text file that you're going to go ahead and run on your computer. Um, probably wouldn't recommend directing any of your users to actually use this, but it does provide some great examples of how we can take a URL for a common application, whether that be a common web browser, Dropbox, Google Drive file stream, you know, these types of things that we're installing all the time, and we're almost always grabbing the latest version from the vendor because they're, they're auto-updating applications in a lot of cases. Um, and you know, if we take a look, sort of, uh, if you go to view raw, you know, and take a look at what this script is doing, that it's encouraging you to just go ahead and trust and run on your Mac. Um, we'll see. All we're doing is going to that particular URL where that application lives, um, perhaps using installer to run that Apple installer package, perhaps opening up and mounting that DMG, copying that application into your applications folder. Um, or you know whatever might be appropriate depending on how they're deploying that application. Um, and, and also, it, maybe there are some applications in your environment that you're not using enough to care to update all the time. Um, I certainly understand the criticism that perhaps uh, we don't want to go ahead and just always deploy from a vendor's website 100% of the time for applications that are system critical. Um, but I can tell you there's a lot of organizations that I meet with and they're like, yeah, we've got a couple users. They're always talking about how they like to use Firefox, but like it's not something that um, we really support at a corporate level, but we want to make it available in self-service. Um, but I don't really want to pay somebody to build that Firefox application every week and a half when they update you know, a point release. Um, you know, leveraging something like this to say, you know what, I've let the user know this is just going to download directly. Um, maybe I've got users that don't have admin rights on their Mac, and we want to make sure that they're going to be able to get that application easily. Um, but you know, we're not so concerned about vetting um, a specific app update because it's not like you know, in our environment we're supporting um, particular Firefox plugins or you know, have a particular requirement for an out of date version. Um, and the same thing, you know, when I'm talking about you know, Flash and Java updaters. My concern with Flash and Java is I'd love it if they didn't exist, but if they're going to be on the systems that we're supporting and managing, I want to make sure that those apps are up to date because inevitably a week goes by and there's a new security vulnerability that we're dealing with. Um, so if that sounds really terrible to you and that's not what you want to do, there are other options. Um, who in here is using auto package? Okay. Easy. Take a little bit of work to set up. Um, Auto Packager um, is a uh, graphical user interface to use Auto Package. Um, the Lindy Group announced recently that they are not actively maintaining this. I don't know if they've found a new home, 
Um, auto package is awesome. Um, would highly recommend using it if that's something that is um, you feel like you've got you know the time and the effort to to put that in in your organization. Um, we found that you know a lot of the folks that we do consulting work for and do training work for might not be a great candidate for that. Um, but I definitely would say you know that is. Uh, an appropriate way to go ahead and get those application updates. Go ahead and make sure that you've got those up-to-date packages. Um, again, leveraging someone else's work to make sure that you're deploying um, something that at least someone else is claiming that they've tested. Um, but you know, being careful to vet those recipes and and test those on your own. Um, you know, I I kind of go back and forth as to whether I feel like I trust someone publishing an auto package recipe or an application vendor directly off their website. It's, you know, maybe sometimes I trust one more than the other. Yeah. Uh, can you talk about what this brings to the table compared to, say, just JS Composer, for example? Yeah, so um, auto package is, rather than taking advantage of, uh, you know, Composer is sort of what you'd be looking at if you're going to publish your own auto package recipes for the community. Um, what we're looking at with auto package is someone else has, you know, built these packages, published them so that you can get access to them. Um, and import them into your JSS, import them into your Monkey Distro, um, or you know whichever tool you're using to deploy these applications. Um, these packages are going to be provided, um, you know, in the community via you know recipes that are published by other users. I'm sure that I'm probably uh, covering this in a very low level of detail compared to some folks in the room that may be using this uh, more heavily than I am. Um, the uh, the benefit is you're taking advantage of someone else who's building those packages, um, whereas what I talked about before is sort of avoiding the packaging altogether. Um, but you know, if we are going to take advantage of, of using packages and we don't want to build them all on our own, we just want to test and validate, um, you know, auto package, great way to go ahead and do that. Um, yeah. Could you skip a... Oh, the catch box. Yes. I'm sorry. Is it on already? I think it is, right? All right, so I use auto package in my environment, and I don't really have the trust issue, I, okay. I guess, with yeah. where they're coming from, because I have all of my auto package recipes feeding to a test monkey manifest. So there's a testing group that gets them first. So if there are any issues with what's being imported, then I'll know about it before 80% of the company gets it. Yep. I'll, if you want to, or we can just toss it around. Um, and yeah, that is, and that's kind of exactly what I'm getting at. If you are an organization that has the time availability and you, know, you have a development server set up and you're utilizing it, I think that's awesome. And I wish I had that much time. Um, I don't think that you know, you're doing anything wrong. I think actually that's really what we'd all like to have the time and the resources to do. Um, but you know, some of us may not have you know, the resources, we may not have the ability to you know, set up a second server to go ahead and do that testing. Um, but absolutely, uh, yes, uh, there are, you know, the right way to go ahead and test these things is you, know, you have your development server, you've got somebody who's doing that testing, um, but you know, I'm sure I'm not the only one in the room that has run into the situation where I'm like, you know what, I'm just gonna just push this out and test in production because it probably is fine. Um, I wouldn't say that I would encourage folks to do that, but we've all been in that spot. Um, so, yeah. Auto package would encourage folks to take a look at that. Um, I'm not going to go super deep into this again. want to cover kind of a, a good number of things here, but you know, we can talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, Microsoft Office updates. Um, who in here installs Office in their environment for, yeah, okay, everybody. Um, has everybody taken a look at macadmins.software? Is everyone familiar with that? Um, maybe you've gone to a session here at PSU put on by the uh, Office for Mac team. Um, there's a great training video and a great set of scripts around uh, using the new version of Mao, um, Microsoft Auto Update. Um, if you are currently still packaging and deploying updates for Microsoft Office in your organization, I would encourage you to stop doing that. Um, if you have a need to do so, because you have to you know, make sure that you are, uh, you, know, you have plugins for Outlook, you wanna make sure that certain versions of Outlook work in your environment. Um, luckily, I'm one of these organizations that doesn't rely upon Outlook, so I don't worry too much about updates to Office. I know that there have been some bad updates that have come out over the past year. 
um, the script and extension attribute set that has been uploaded by the Office for Mac team um, allows you to leverage the auto update capabilities of Microsoft Auto Update, but do that at your discretion. Um, so you can, you know, sort of set Microsoft Auto Update to no longer prompt your users to go ahead and install those updates. They're not going to get bothered, but you can kick off that routine in the background and leverage that automatic update capability, um, where it'll go ahead and download those updates. Um, if anybody's used the auto update capability, you know, even just on their own Mac using the you know standard auto updater, if we turn on that automatically install updates, you'll notice if you have an application open, you've got Microsoft Word open, you've got uh, say you've got Excel open. In the upper right-hand corner, it'll say there's an update available. We noticed your app's open, so maybe if you want to restart it, you can. But otherwise, it'll go ahead and update at the next time you launch that application. Um, this is great. Um, and way, way better than what we had to deal with before. Um, and you know, simply leveraging that script and identifying which targeted versions we want to update to, um, you know, whether we want to have those updates run on a recurring basis, maybe you're an organization like we are where I don't really care too much about you know, vetting particular office updates. I just want to make sure that that stuff stays up to date. So I go ahead and run that routine once a week. And if there is an app update available, it'll go ahead and you know, keep my users up to the current version. Because I just don't want to be bothered by the phone call of, oh, you know, I saw there's an update to Office. And you, know, you guys should help us get that up to date. Um, Adobe Remote Update Manager, Adobe RUM, same concept. Um, if you're supporting you know, Creative Cloud for Teams in your organization and your users you know, maybe are not keeping their Adobe apps up to date, but you want to keep them up to date, we have another command line utility. We can package that up as part of the Adobe Creative Cloud Packager. Um, not sure where I'm standing and getting the feedback, but. Um, catch five. Catch five. Oh, you're right. That actually might be it. Um, and uh, we can call it via script. We can give it you know, some specifics if there are some specific applications that we want to have install, or if we simply run it with no interaction um, and simply call it, it'll just go ahead and update whichever available applications um, are eligible for update. Um, so super, super nice way to you know, not have to worry about those particular updates. Um, and then you know, when we're talking about that zero touch deployment that you know, we kind of bring back to the beginning where we were talking about uh, what everybody came in here to talk about, um, you know, take advantage of tools like DEP Notify um, or Splash Buddy if you prefer. I found DEP Notify to be super easy to configure. Um, this is probably one of the most generous things I've ever seen, but all I have to do is write out to a log file, um, which, you know, for those who um, are not quite sure how to do that, if we just, you know, echo out in the terminal as part of our policy that we're executing and go ahead and write that to a particular log file location, you know, have those, you know, two carrots at the end of our uh, line in a bash script, we can go ahead and display whatever we want here to prompt our user, let them know what's going on. We can even interact with the user, gather information, pass those variables to a script, um, and, you know, allow our user to sort of feel like they have some involvement in that initial setup. So, you know, if you go through the DEP setup, uh, especially with Jamf Pro, um, I know there are some feature requests for, you know, configuration weight and some other things that we'd all really like to have, especially folks who are looking at using things like Nomad Login. Um, at the moment, we don't have the ability to do those things. So uh, what I found very successful is, you know, setting up a launch daemon. Um, and there are some folks who have published ways to do this. Um, you know, all we need to do is, you know, wait until the user is logged in and, you know, at the desktop um, after they've gone through that setup assistant, we pop up DEP notify and let them know, you know, we're still doing stuff. We've got some policies that are getting called. Um, and we're using custom triggers to go ahead and call those throughout um, our DEP notify script that we have execute. So we can, you know, leverage that same policy that we have available in self-service for our other users and just call the ones that we want to go ahead and install those applications. So if I need Chrome and I need Office and I need, you know, Adobe Creative Cloud, you know, all getting installed on a new Mac, um, I can go ahead and call those line by line in a script, wait for those policies to execute. When it executes, it'll go ahead and write that line item to the script um, or to the log file, which will show up here at the bottom of that DEP notify window. We can brand this with our own company branding. Um, and you know, once we're done, we just go ahead and you know, write to the log file to go ahead and close out a DEP notify. And then your user 
you know, is made aware, they can go ahead and start using their new Mac. Um, you know, this is kind of that missing piece uh, in the whole DP, step one, turn on your computer, step two, there isn't a step two. Well, you know, there's a whole lot of stuff that needs to happen between step one and step two, um, and we want to make sure that our users are aware of, of what they should be doing while they're waiting for that to complete. Just a little talk about File Vault 2. Um, one of the things we're doing as part of uh, using DEP Notify is actually just popping up a window asking the user for the password that they created when they first created their account, uh, when they set up their new Mac, or as part of that enrollment. Uh, you know, if we go ahead and have them you know, run a quick ad package or go um, to a user-initiated enrollment URL to enroll their new Mac, we actually use DEP Notify even for those enrollments for computers that are not being enrolled with DEP give them a progress bar of the things that we're setting up initially as part of a new enrollment. Um, one of the really nice things about File Vault 2 with APFS is that it no longer requires a restart. So um, I'm, you know, maybe some folks have seen if you go into System Preferences now and you go ahead and enable File Vault, it'll just go ahead and get that started um, even without you having to reboot your Mac like you had in 10.12 and earlier. Um, the problem is, is that if we use some of the traditional methods we've been using to enable File Vault 2, say, you know, using a configuration profile to require it at next reboot, um, we're then still prompting the user to restart their computer when they first set it up uh, the first time, uh, which isn't necessarily the great, greatest user experience, and we also might have users that aren't complying. Um, so just prompting the user to go ahead and enable File Vault, making sure that that profile is in place to enforce it in case something goes wrong. Um, but we're actually able to see now during that DEP notify process, we just prompt the user, say, type in your password. We're going to go ahead and encrypt your Mac right here, right now, is uh, first thing you go, go ahead and do when you set up. Um, and it doesn't require the user to reboot, and that can take place while all these other things are happening. These software installations are coming down. Um, and you know, the way you can go ahead and interactively you know, ask the user, we can either use DEP notify natively. Um, we can call an Apple script, use Cocoa Dialog. Um, I know there are a couple other tools out there that can do this, but you know, simply popping up a window and asking the user, you know, give me some stuff so that I know what to do. Um, also, you know, leveraging the same sort of user interaction to identify you know, maybe some information about the computer and what items should get installed. Um, we're not an AD shop. We're not using Active Directory. Um, maybe there are some other folks in the room that are trying to figure out how do I find out whether the person's in the accounting department if, they're, if we're not using Active Directory. Um, one way that we found very successful is just prop up to the user and say, you know, what building do you work in? What department do you work in? Maybe what's your name? What's the asset tag that we stuck on the computer? Um, you know, give the user a little something to do as part of that initial enrollment and most of the time people are going to be pretty accurate about it. Um, so if you're not leveraging some other method to get that information about what should be taking place as part of that initial DEP setup. Um, you know, rely on the user to take advantage of that. So I said I was going to talk a little bit about patch. Um, I don't have a whole lot of new news about this other than to say um, I, you know, I don't have any particular insight to think that uh, patch is ever going to be much more than what it is that we see right now. Um, I know that some folks have really been hoping for some sort of, you know, repositories to be available with application updates, um, but, you know, that's kind of a liability for a software vendor to be providing, you know, third-party application updates as part of their um, software solution. Um, and, you know, the, the solution is now set up where you can have those external patch sources. Um, but these are largely definitions. Um, and the only thing that we can use patch policies for um, is deploying packages. Um, so if we're using some of those you know, other uh, solutions that I brought up earlier about how we can deal with um, applications that maybe we don't want to package, um, you know, we're, there are still some uh, feature requests out there to go ahead and include scripts in uh, you know, patch policies. But um, you know, you're still stuck providing those packages. Uh, so I would definitely recommend taking advantage of the patch definitions to see where your uh, managed devices are as far as whether they're up to date. Um, but I would say you know, this is probably going to be something that you're not necessarily going to be using a whole lot unless you're an organization that has that capability to you know, spend the time testing um, and you know, making sure that your packages are, are up to date. Um, and then, you know, just some best practice around configuration profiles. This, again, may be basic for some folks in the room, um, but 
keeping yourself organized um, also can make things a lot easier. Um, just kind of reiterating some, some basics around this. One payload per profile, ideally, unless you have to do something differently, like maybe there's a um, known issue with certain you know, payloads that are being installed. I don't know if anybody's dealt with security and privacy recently, but um, pairing that with a restrictions profile might be something we have to do at the moment. Um, but you know, in general, if we can keep these things separate, we can very granularly assign things to each device um, that way, rather than kind of building one mega profile that has everything in it. Um, doing that kind of leads us to the same problem we had with monolithic disk imaging. We've got you know, one big image that's got everything in it, and then we constantly have to keep that up to date. Um, if we do that with configuration profiles, um, that can cause some really nasty things to happen from time to time. Um, if you have a Wi-Fi or network payload as part of your master profile that you're deploying and you have devices that are on Wi-Fi, um, making an update to that profile, when you go ahead and say apply to all devices, we might actually see all those devices drop off the Wi-Fi network because we're actually pulling that profile off before we put the new one on. Um, so, and, and also troubleshooting just is a lot easier if we can kind of narrow that down to one specific item rather than this you know, behemoth mega profile that's got everything in it. Um, and you know, take advantage of that for settings. Um, if you're not using custom settings uh, profiles at the moment, um, please take a look at that. Start using it. Um, yeah, let me toss this back. Um, MacAdmins.software as well. Um, I'm going to have to toss this like a few times back, I think. So, uh, if you go to Preferences link, MacAdmins.software, it'll give you some information about how we can manage those settings for Office. Um, also, you take a look at any P list that you've got. You can also you know, really manage any setting that's available for a given application. But yeah. Uh, what are your thoughts on signing configuration profiles to make them read only? We had an issue a couple weeks ago where all of a sudden all, all our webcams were turned off. <laughs> and Jam's suggestion was to sign the profile so that that doesn't happen. So that is um, a known product issue uh, at the moment in Jamf Pro as of, I believe, 10.3.0 which is what I was mentioning kind of just to see the room if anybody noticed about the uh, issue with security and privacy. So uh, when you install a security and privacy profile currently in Jamf Pro, it will apply restrictions that you did not intend to apply, one of those being to disable the camera. Um, there are a couple ways to get around that at the moment, um, and there are some articles on Jamf Nation that'll go into some details about this. One of them is to create your profile somewhere else and sign it. And that way, when you upload it into Jamf Pro, it will not modify it. And that's where signing the profile and uploading it is read-only. Um, I like to create profiles in Jamf Pro, so I kind of don't like to do that because then I have to rely on another tool like Apple Configurator to go ahead and build that profile. Um, the, the solution that I've found the easiest to deal with that particular issue has been to pair to do the thing that I'm telling you not to do with multiple payloads in the same profile. Um, but if you add a restrictions payload to that same security and privacy payload, um, you'll notice that that camera checkbox is checked or unchecked. Can't remember which way it is. Um, but you can go ahead and modify those restrictions. But they do have to be in the same profile because otherwise you'll have those conflicting settings get applied. Um, but yeah, we've seen quite a lot of that. Um, if you have an existing security and privacy payload that you're pushing out as part of a profile that doesn't have this issue, it won't happen to you if you don't edit the profile. <laughs> Um, but uh, if, if that ends up impacting you, you see some users with their camera disabled, um, that's at least at the moment the workaround that I've found easiest to deal with is just to go ahead and add that restrictions payload to that same security and privacy profile, but then you've got to you know, remember that those two things are paired together. Um, so before I get into kind of more general questions, um, just talk a little bit about what my team does. Um, We've got a table downstairs. Um, I'm not going to, you know, do a whole lot of a, you know, big sales pitch here, but you know, we kind of do two things uh, for the folks that might be in attendance. We can, you know, kind of do everything for you if you're an organization where you're like, I just don't want to do this anymore, and I'm here because I, you know, am forced to, and I really don't want to do this. But I imagine most folks in the room, maybe you could just use a little bit of help. Um, and we do, you know, a lot of training and consulting for folks. We'll come out to your site. We'll do it remotely. Um, if there are some things that we can do to help, you know, get you kind of over that hump to a place where you're in a position to be more equipped to manage the devices, be in a place where you're, you know, feeling more confident with Jap Pro, um, you know, we'd be happy to help you with that. And anybody who has interest, uh, got cards and flyers and stuff, and we'd be happy to talk to you throughout the week. Um, 
I guess with that, um, any other questions? Yeah. As far as patch Let me patch catch box. Yeah. As far as uh, patch management is concerned, um, you know, it seems like there's two or three different places in Jamf Pro on the server to look at that. One deals with uh, volume purchasing program, and the other one deals with just regular apps and maybe plugins. And so, um, and going through and you know checking you know the software you want to roll updates it doesn't just work like that so you got to put in some information in there i was wondering if there's a short walkthrough you could do on that yeah um so uh i could certainly pull that up i think live demos in this sort of environment might not be um i i'll probably stumble through that so um i'll talk about it in the narrative but if you want to come you know uh sit down with us a little bit later i'd be more than happy to talk you through that but uh, what he's talking about, we got three different places that we're kind of looking at um, for application updates potentially, and also three places we might be looking at, you know, what the current version is for an application we're patching. Um, you know, one of those is VPP, um, and if we're taking advantage of making sure that we're actually checking to automatically update apps um, as part of VPP, you know, then all we need to do is make sure that that's assigned, and, you know, once a week it'll go ahead and check with the App Store and go ahead and push out that new update. Um, patch definitions and patch policies um, are all under, you know, patch reporting. Um, and if I go back to my previous slide here, um, we'll see if we click under patch management on the left-hand side uh, inside of Jamf Pro, um, we can go ahead and add each one of those applications in. Um, some of those applications rely just upon checking the version um, in the inventory you're already collecting. Um, some of those are going to require an extension attribute to be created. Um, I know with Flash and Java in particular, it's going to, you know, ask you to accept the terms of running that extension attribute. That's because you are running a script um, to go ahead and collect that information. Um, and, you know, so that's, you know, sort of our second place. Um, but if we are using scripts or we're, you know, not using patch policies to keep an application up to date, then you know we may still be using a smart group to monitor for that uh, type of information, and that's where you know we kind of may have a third place where we're actually creating a policy um, to run that script, and you know we're maybe monitoring a smart group to see you know whether an application is up to date. And I know you know I, I can see the frustration. I get it. Um, you know, and that's why I'm I'm trying to you know point out well, you know this is super great, but it's only going to work for that percentage of applications that are available. Um, as patch definitions, I know there is an open patch server that's being developed in the community, and um, you know Jamf has kind of published some proof of concepts around importing additional patch definitions into Jamf Pro. And I think as we see some more, um, you know, movement in that area, we'll start to see, uh, you know, more applications be available in that library. But I would say that you know the library that is provided in Jamf Pro is pretty comprehensive. We've got you know the Microsoft and Adobe, a lot of the security software, um, a lot of built-in apps. Um, but, you know, there's definitely a lot more probably that you're supporting in your environment than just what's in that list. Um, yeah, let's uh, toss this way. It's soft. <laughs> Where's it going? Um, we're, we're not a Jamf uh, customer, but okay. uh, very interested. Um, and we use a competitor's product, and we're really struggling with MDM and DEP. And I was just curious um, when, uh, when it connect, when the you know, out of the box experience, when it, the MacBook connects to DEP, and then it goes through the wizards. If your customer, if you're joined to the, uh, to AD, yep, um, and the wizard is prompting the user to create an account, how does that work with an AD joined account? Um, so in, if, if you were using Jamf Pro, and right. I, I know depending on which, uh, which MDM vendor you're using, this may be a little bit different, but if we go down to you know, pre-stage enrollments um, here for uh, setting up our you know, DEP enrollment in Jamf Pro, one of the options there is going to be what do you want to do um, with the local user accounts. Um, so there's a local accounts payload where we can say create an admin account create a standard account if we don't want that user to be admin, or we have an option that's even further down that says don't create an account at all, uh, which is probably gonna be appropriate if you're looking to bind the computer and have the user log in with an AD account. So um, instead it'll bring up and they can you know, click on other or select, you know, just type in their username and password and it'll create that local account based on your bind. Um, but you know, uh, one other thing I'd encourage you to take a look at is you know, 
is you know is binding in fact something that is necessary in your environment um, there are you know there's definitely been some great development um, by Joel Rennick and his team with uh, with nomad um, Apple's got enterprise connect um, you know there are some issues that can come up with you know 80 bound max and just kind of make sure you weigh the differences because um, nomad can get you a lot of the, the same benefits there um, without the bind yeah we're having the file vote issue with AD, when they change their AD password, the file vault doesn't get the memo. Um, and actually, even if you're binding, um, you know, products like Nomad can help you with that so that when the user changes their password, it makes sure to change it in all three places, both the user account password, the keychain password, and your file vault 2 password. Thanks. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah. Uh, can you talk a little more about uh, device-based VPP. Uh, I know when Apple first pitched a VPP to us, it was based on users, and that was an absolute non-starter in our environment. So uh, can you talk a little more about this new device-based model for it? Yeah. So a um, little history lesson for, for some folks. Started with VPP and iOS. Um, kind of started along the lines of, well, Apple said apps are gifts, um, much like cups of coffee. So we should just give them away. Um, have your users submit an expense report, or we can use VPP to generate redemption codes. Um, you know, that didn't go so well for a lot of folks. Um, so then we had user-based VPP, uh, which is still available, and you know, some organizations are using that. Um, user-based uh, assignments for VPP are great if you have users with multiple devices, because it only consumes one license for all of their devices that are logged in with that same Apple ID. Um, but device-based VPP gets around all of that, so you don't even have to have your user log in with an Apple ID. Um, if we go ahead into you know, our Mac App Store app that we're uh, going ahead and installing, if you go to the VPP tab and you have managed distribution set up and not codes, if you're not on a legacy account with VPP, um, if you just go ahead and check that box, if the application's not installed um, in your Mac, so you, you would have to purchase the app from VPP, Apple Business Manager, Apple School Manager, um, but if you have that in your Jamf Pro server, um, you'll see the option to go ahead and assign. Um, and you'll just want to go ahead and make sure that you, know, you check that box. You've got it set to go ahead and install automatically if it's something you want to keep up to date and have automatically assigned. Um, and it'll just go ahead and install that in the background um, and you know, without any user interaction. There are some prerequisite things that need to be there, though, for that to take place. And that's where you know, we want to make sure that user level MDM has been enabled. So we need to make sure that um, you know, we have those app installations from the Mac App Store only occurring after the user has created their user account and get it, got logged in. Um, if you're not using uh, LDAP accounts, you know, a bound computer to Active Directory, um, we want to make sure that local user is the one that's enabled for, uh, for VPP and is the, if you go into your inventory record, you'll see MDM enabled users. You want to make sure that that user is enabled. Um, and that's where making sure that you have smart groups um, to kind of check for that. Um, one of the issues that we see a lot of folks run into is, you know, we've got it scoped to, you know, like all computers. So you get your computer set up and you don't have a user set up yet. Um, so that VPP, uh, you know, user level MDM is not enabled yet. And the command goes out and it fails. And then it just sits there um, and it doesn't install. Um, so we want to make sure that we have all those prerequisite things set up. Um, before we go ahead and kick off that installation. Um, and also just, you know, from time to time to make sure to clear out those potentially failed commands if there is an issue with the App Store installation, because it, I'll, I'll admit, you know, does not work 100% of the time, um, but there are some things we can do to, you know, help make that work better. Um, the other problem, too, is if you get a new Mac, what does it come with? Uh, you know, five or six applications from, uh, from Apple, from the App Store that are, you know, sitting there waiting for user adoption. Um, if we don't delete those apps that are sitting there waiting for adoption, the you know, new apps that we want to push from VPP won't get installed. Um, so one of the things that we do is we go ahead and script removal of those apps, um, you know, delete Keynote, Numbers, Pages, iMovie, GarageBand. It's bad that I've spent enough time remembering those five applications. Make sure we delete those before we kick off that VPP installation. Um, but once we do that and we get it installed, um, keeping it up to date is super simple. We don't have to do anything. It just, you know, so long as that checkbox is checked, it'll just go ahead and check in at whatever time window that is to see if there's an update available. Anybody else? Cool. 
Well, I appreciate your time. Um, I can stick around for you know any questions or if anybody uh, wants any information from us, but I'm also happy to let folks uh, wrap up. Um, thanks for coming. Um, hope this was at least a little bit helpful. Um, and I uh, hope everybody has a good conference. Thanks for, thanks for showing up uh, first thing in the morning here. Yeah, sure.